Hey, welcome back. We're looking at another Shakespeare today. Today's play is Titus Andronicus, Shakespeare's notoriously violent tragedy. Now, if you've read some of his other tragedies, like Hamlet or Macbeth, you know sometimes there is blood and guts and gore. They don't have anything on this play. As a quick heads up and warning, this is definitely the most R-rated of Shakespeare's works. If you don't want to hear about violence, rape, mutilation, and all kinds of really, really, really awful stuff, now's the time to back away. I'm not kidding. We're going dark. In fact, I wore red today just so the blood splatter didn't show so much. Also, since I've been enjoying doing these Shakespeare discussions so much, and since I usually get to do them around my lunchtime, I thought I would make a new segment called Lunchtime with Shakespeare. Let's see what I've got for lunch today. Pie! Oh boy, what flavor! Pie flavored. So for a long time, people kind of dismissed Titus Andronicus as a play because of the intensity of violence. If the first thing you see is death after death after death, dismemberment, rape, mutilation, horrible things, it's very distracting. And a lot of people just close their eyes and turn away from it and say, Oh, this is a horrible play. Let's not watch this anymore. When that happens, you miss out on some very complex things Shakespeare's doing. The play is much richer and more complex than it seems at first glance. Because yes, it does play like a slasher film sometimes, but within that, there are all kinds of very complex themes and ideas being explored. Let's talk about a few of them. Some of the themes would be perfectly relevant today, such as the silencing of victims of sexual crime or issues of otherness and racism. Of course, the primary driving theme of this play is the idea of revenge. But instead of just being a straight revenge play, or revenge story, something like, say, The Count of Monte Cristo, Shakespeare makes this a double revenge story. Both the families within the story are mutually trying to get revenge on each other. Both Tamara, who lost her child to Titus, and Titus, who lost his children to Saturninus, feel that desire to pay back their enemies for what they've been given. And the double revenge plot opens up the door for the idea of spiraling violence. I do bad to you, so you have to do bad to me, so I have to do bad to you, back and forth and back and forth until all of us are dead. Which ultimately culminates in a final scene with intense gore, lots of people get stabbed really quick. Of course, another aspect within this are the victims of all of this. Lavinia, the daughter of Titus, is a complex character and can be played in a lot of ways given the ambiguity of her character. She is a victim of rape and mutilation. And of course, Titus wants revenge for that, but he also kills her in the play. And there's a complex relationship with this female character. Does this female character who has been sexually used and violated have any right? Or is she shameful to her family? There are moments when Marcus and Titus weep with Lavinia, and there's a moment at the end when Titus slaughters Lavinia. Is that a mercy killing? Is he putting her out of her misery? Or is he responding to his own griefs and taking them out on his poor, already violated daughter? We mentioned her silence. Her tongue is cut out and her hands are cut off so that she may neither speak the names of her rapist nor write it. Ultimately, she is able to do so by placing a large stick within her mouth and drawing in the sand. Even that feels like a kind of violation. There's a big emphasis on mouths throughout this. The devouring mouth of the pit, where Tamara's sons throw the body of Basinius. Lavinia's bloody mouth after her tongue has been cut out, and later on her mouth that is again violated with the stick she uses to communicate. And of course, Tamara's bloody mouth at the end of the play. The act of eating and devouring is a kind of violence and a kind of sensual sexual kind of violence. There's also a huge challenge to the idea of otherness. We start out with two teams, the Romans and the Goths. We are the Romans, we are civilized, those are the Goths, those are the barbarians. And Titus has spent his last many, many years fighting against the Goths. He's lost the majority of his sons in battle to the Goths. And he's coming home victorious with goth prisoners, and it's an us versus them, which pretty quickly fades to gray. The sense of otherness, the other, becomes very confused when Tamara goes from being prisoner to being empress. And suddenly, instead of being the enemy and the prisoner of war, she becomes one of the rulers and definitely the motivating factor behind the action within this entire play. There's also the dichotomy of family versus foes. 
which is made very complex within the first scene, as Titus's own sons turn against him to defend Basinius's claim on Lavinia. Both Saturninus, who Titus was supporting as emperor, and Basinius have claimed Lavinia to be their bride. Basinius had the primary claim, but since Saturninus is emperor, Titus feels like it's his duty to hand his daughter over to Saturninus. That tension between duty and family gets very blended and complex. You see, all of these tensions are made more difficult by Titus, who is a black and white kind of thinker. He's an action hero. He's gone out and stabbed things for his whole life. He's the Sylvester Stallone of the play. And now that he is at home and suddenly all the lines get, are getting really blurred, he no longer knows what to think or what to do. His first action when he walks back in is to cast his vote for the most traditional of the sons, the eldest son to be the new emperor. And then when Saturninus asks for his daughter, he hands her over to him in spite of the fact that he already promised his daughter to Basinius, because it's duty. But quickly, when his family defies him, all those lines get confused. As the play goes on, Titus no longer can find the enemy to stab at, and he breaks down. When it was him versus the Goths, it was easy. When it was him doing his duty to the emperor, it was easy. He was even willing to kill his own son for duty. But once those lines of otherness get blurred, he no longer knows who he is or what he should do. He descends to breaking down and demanding answers from a woman whose tongue has already been cut out. It's only when he sinks to the very, very bottom does he see his course again. And that course is revenge. Revenge. Very sweet. But even here, it's clear that Titus errs. He finds a path, the path is revenge. All that revenge does is cause a greater bloodbath. I've already commented on the tension within the family ties. Another complex theme in relationship to otherness is the issue of race. We have a character who is black in this play, Aaron the Moor. And it's worth comparing him to Shakespeare's other famous black character, Othello. Whereas Aaron fits the very negative racial stereotype that might have been seen in Shakespeare's day, Othello is sort of a counterpoint to that. Aaron is lustful, he is violent, he is sadistic. He is just through and through evil. Othello, on the other hand, is faithful. He is loyal. He is good. It's only through the manipulation of Iago that he crumbles. In fact, Shakespeare's play Othello looks at racism from the perspective of the racist. Iago is the person who assumes that Othello is lustful and rotten and crooked inside because of his skin color, while very clearly he's not. But is Aaron a complete stereotype? One interesting thing about this character is that he is the only parent figure who doesn't murder his own children. The other parent figures who we're supposed to maybe empathize with? Titus kills two of his children for different reasons. One out of a misguided sense of duty, and the other sort of to make a point. And Tamara even, in spite of her love for her children, decides to kill the one who is biracial because she's afraid for her own skin. Aaron is the only one who defends his child, his offspring. He's willing to kill other people to protect his own child, which isn't terribly surprising considering that Aaron kills people for fun, but later on in the play, he even risks his own life and sacrifices himself for the protection of his child. He confesses to absolutely every crime in the play so that he can keep his child alive. And although he dies cursing and telling everyone that he wishes he had hurt them more, he still has that affection for his child, which is not a thing that runs deep in this play. All right, it's time to get into a summary of the text after a bite of pie. Act one opens with the old emperor of Rome having recently died, and now the throne is open. Who's going to take the throne? He has two sons, Saturninus and Basinius. Saturninus is the elder son, and so by Tradition, the elder son usually takes the throne, but Basinius is the better man, according to Basinius. The two of them and their armies are ready to duke it out and fight over it, until Marcus Andronicus stands up and says, Hey guys, what about Titus? Titus has been off fighting our wars, he's been off being a hero for our country for years and years and years. Here he is coming home from war. He deserves to rule more than any of the rest of us. And both Saturninus and Basinius say, you know what, you're right, Titus should be king. In comes Titus with his 
few remaining children. He had 25 sons at one point, and now he has four and one daughter. And he comes in bearing the coffins of his dead sons. He also comes with prisoners from the Goths. He's finally beaten the Goths, and he's brought in Tamara and her three sons. The very first thing they do is start a big funeral ceremony for all of his dead children, and he says, in payment for the death of all my sons, I'm going to slaughter one of Tamara's children. And so he takes her oldest son and cuts him to pieces right there in front of everybody, in spite of the fact that Tamara begs him to show mercy. But he says, I can't. It's part of the tradition of things that my children died and therefore I have to pay for it with your child. Again, Titus doesn't spend a lot of time thinking. All he does is action. Tamara is devastated and very, very angry. Then when everyone asks Titus to be emperor, he says, you know what? No, I go with tradition. I say Saturninus should be emperor because he's the oldest son of the old emperor. And so Titus gives up his claim to emperor to Saturninus. And Saturninus says, as my first act as emperor, to honor you, I want you to marry your daughter to me. And Titus says, absolutely, because it's my duty to my country to give up my family, my life in battle, and everything I have to my emperor. Here is my daughter. But at that moment, Bassinius says, no way! She's already engaged to me. And so he snatches Lavinia and runs away. And all the rest of Titus's sons defend them as they escape. Titus, having just promised his daughter to the emperor, now sees it his duty to fight through his sons and get his daughter back. And so he murders one of his own children standing in his way. Down to three sons now. Lavinia and Bassinius have run off and gotten married now. And Saturninus is not happy with Titus anymore that he let his family do this. So Titus went from being great war hero, nearly the emperor, to suddenly being out of favor with the man he put in power. And since Saturninus is so angry with Titus, he turns around and marries Tamara, who is the very sexy prisoner. And so she goes from being goth queen and the enemy to the empress in 30 seconds. And now she holds a particular seat of power, and she begs Saturninus to publicly forgive the Andronicus family. But secretly, she plans on killing them all in revenge for the death of her son. Titus's children come back, and they beg him to bury Mutius, the son that he killed, in the family tomb. Titus at first is hesitant about this because he felt like his son was dishonoring him by going against his wishes and the emperor's wishes. But they say, no, we were just defending family honor because Lavinia was already pledged to Pisenius. It wasn't right of Saturninus to ask for her in the first place. And he finally submits. Act 1 ends with everyone pretending to make up, but Tamara still has a vendetta against Titus. And in fact, Act 1 ends in a sort of strange way. Technically, the scene still hasn't even ended, because Act 2 begins with Aaron staying on the stage. Aaron's been along for the ride with the prisoners, but we find out at this point that he is Tamara's lover. And now he feels like he's going to get more control by being connected with the Empress of Rome. Then he breaks up a fight between the two remaining sons of Tamara who are fighting because both of them really like Lavinia and both of them want to win her over. And by like Lavinia, I mean basically both of them want to sleep with her. They're about to come to blows and kill each other over her when Aaron says, hey, what's the big deal? Both of you can have her, just take, drag her off into the woods and rape her. And they're like, oh yeah, that'd be cool, sure. And so they all agree. As part of the whole making up thing, Titus invited the emperor and empress out to a hunting party with him and his family. So they're all out in the woods where no one can hear you scream. And Aaron has come up with this clever plan to ruin everybody's life. So he is flirting with Tamara and uh, telling his plan to her when all of a sudden in come Lavinia and Bassinius. They catch Aaron and Tamara together and they're like, oh, 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 we caught you. You all are in big trouble. But then Aaron gets Tamara to argue with Lavinia and Bassinius, and as they're arguing, in comes her two sons, Chiron and Demetrius, who stab Bassinius and then drag Lavinia off to rape her. They even make horrible comments like talking about using her dead husband's body as a pillow for their bed. Aaron tells them to make sure that they take care of Lavinia after doing the act, or else she'll tattle on them and everything will go wrong. And then he has a plan to cover it up. He chucks the body of Bassinius into a pit and then takes Titus's two sons up to the pit and says, I found a great panther down here that you can hunt, and then pushes them in. 
when they fall in, they're in a pit with a dead body, and in comes everybody else who sees them down there with a dead body, thinking that they're trying to hide their crime. And then Aaron has secretly hidden a bag of gold and a letter around that confesses to the murder, the plan for murder, from Titus's two sons. And so suddenly Titus has this letter in his hands that says that his two sons were planning to murder Basinius. There's also a bag of gold that they plan to do as part of the whole plot. So they are caught red-handed. They are dragged off by Saturninus, the emperor, and prepared for execution. Titus doesn't believe his sons would have done this. They were so noble and so honorable, and he's completely confused. He begs for mercy for them, but there is no mercy coming. Meanwhile, Chiron and Demetrius have finished with Lavinia, and they hack off her hands and cut out her tongue so that she has no way of telling who did this to her. She cannot speak anymore or write their names. And then they make fun of her for a while and leave her. Her uncle Marcus finds her and is horrified at her state. And there's some incredibly gross descriptions of her trying to speak and blood bubbling out of her mouth. This play is so nasty. Act 3. Those two sons who were caught in the act are being led off to execution and Titus is begging for their mercy from the tribunals. Nobody listens to him. And he finally just falls on his face and keeps talking into the dirt. His remaining son, Lucius, comes up, and we discover that he has been banished because he tried to fight to set them free. And so now he's about to leave the country. Just at this point, Marcus comes up with the horribly mutilated Lavinia, and Titus's worst day is, is happening here. He's horrified by everything, and he's completely powerless. He does not know what to do. He's always been a tough action hero. He always has known where to strike, but at this point, he is completely baffled by the world around him. He keeps begging Lavinia to speak even though she can't. He doesn't know what to do. He almost, he sits down next to her and suggests that he cut off his own hands so that he can join her in her misery. He's completely powerless to act because he has no direction. But at that point, Aaron comes in and gives him a direction. He says that Saturninus has said that if one of the three guys, either Titus or Marcus or Lucius, will cut off their own hand and send it to him, he will exonerate the two sons. And so all three of them fight to be the one to get their hand cut off. But Titus, using a little bit of deception, manages to get his own hand chopped off. And he gives it to Aaron to bring to Saturninus. And now he's done something heroic and sacrificial to save his sons. A few minutes later, a messenger comes back with the two heads of his sons and his hand, being like, I don't know why you cut off your hand, but here's your kids' heads. And he realizes that it was all a trick of Aaron's. In that moment, he finally stops crying because he has seen a direction. And there's a sort of a change and a turning in him. As he was descending farther and farther into helplessness, and groveling in the dirt and begging a, a mute woman to give him answers, suddenly he sees his direction and his direction is revenge. Unfortunately, it's been revenge all along. It's all been Tamara's revenge against him that's caused all of these disasters. There's another weird scene in Act 3 where Marcus kills a fly at the dinner table and Titus talks about the poor innocent fly's family. How dare he murder a fly? Because, you know, his family might need him. But then Marcus is like, the fly was black, like Aaron. And then Titus is like, man, I hate that guy. I really, really, really want to kill him. Uh, and it shows sort of that he's becoming unhinged. There's a little bit of madness going into this second half of Titus Andronicus. Of course, we'll see that the madness is a lot more for show by the end. Okay, so in the next scene, at the beginning of Act 4, we see Lavinia taking a bit more charge of her existence. Now, she has been the victim of sexual crime, and she has been raped and violated, and she's been silenced in all of that in every way possible. Even her own family members fail to listen to her while demanding that she speak. It's at the beginning of Act 4 that she finds a way to speak. She's sitting with her nephew, young Lucius, who is reading some books, and she gets very excited, and she begins to wildly gesticulate towards one of the books. It's Ovid's Metamorphosis, and she turns to a story about Philomel, a woman who was raped and then had her tongue cut out in order to keep her from confessing. Obviously, this is what inspired the two sons of Tamara to do this to Lavinia. And so she's able to communicate to her uncle Marcus and her father Titus that this is what happened to her. 
Then she takes a stick in her mouth and writes in the sand the names of the two guys who did this to her. She's finally found a way to communicate again and to convey her message to her father. Unfortunately, her father has complex feelings towards her at this point. He's vacillating back and forth between urging her to suicide and also weeping for her. He's begun to think more and more in terms of her, his daughter's death because of the unbearable shame that she's undergone. But is that shame as much hers or is it more his own shame that he's worried about here? So now that Lavinia has regained a method of communication, she has found a way of conveying her ideas, Titus knows his course. He knows who he wants to get revenge against. And we have that continual mutual revenge between Tamara and Titus. In the next scene, Titus sends young Lucius, his grandson, to carry some weapons as a present to the two men who raped and mutilated his daughter. And with it is a bit of a message, which sounds like just some old Latin bit of poetry, but really it's a hint to the fact that he knows. Only Aaron is quick enough to understand. Also, at this point, we have a new development. Tamara has just had a baby, and the baby is clearly not Saturninus's. Because she has a biracial baby, suddenly there's a bit of conflict. The nurse brings it to Aaron and asks him to kill it. She's afraid that when Saturninus finds out that she has had a child with Aaron, he will be less than pleased. And so Tamara is willing to kill her own child. Aaron, however, is not. After murdering the witnesses, the nurse and the midwife, he goes to switch out the children and place a white child in Tamara's bed. Then he decides that he will take the child himself and take care of it among the Goths, and he leaves to continue caring for this child. Demetrius and Chiron are not happy with the fact that Aaron has done this to their mother. Demetrius says, Villain, what hast thou done? And Aaron says, That which thou canst not undo. And Chiron says, Thou hast undone our mother. And Aaron says, Villain, I have done thy mother. And Aaron, who shows really no respect for absolutely anyone, shows real affection for his child. Scene three cuts to Titus, who seems like he's gone a little nuts. He's shooting arrows at the sky, hoping that the gods will see the letters strapped to them and see the need for justice, because there just isn't justice in the world anymore. He also hands a letter to a passing countryman who takes it to Saturninus. All of these letters demand justice from Saturninus and Tamara and the family. Saturninus is not so happy to see all this happening. People are getting these letters dropped in their yard all over the place that talk about the crimes of Saturninus and his family. Not only that, but he gets another important piece of news. Lucius, who was exiled, has gone to the Goths, raised a big army, and is marching back into Rome. So suddenly, the Goths are the ones backing our heroes? Weren't we fighting with them earlier? As I said before, the line between friends and foes really gets grayed and blurred here. Rome, which is supposed to be the good guys, is obviously not treating the Andronicus family well. And the Goths, who were their sworn enemies for the longest time, are now their best hope for safety. So Saturninus has to do something about the army marching towards him, so he sends a message to Lucius, can we meet at your father's house and talk this out? And so Tamara decides to go to Titus's house and try to sway him to sweet talk Lucius into this conference, avoiding a little bit of bloodshed here. I guess avoiding Saturninus and Tamara's bloodshed. Act 5 begins with Aaron being captured by Lucius and his army. And once they see him and his child, they identify him as one of the definite friends of their enemies. They suggest killing the child until Aaron says he'll confess to everything and explain everything if they'll just save his child. And so he does. He confesses to all of the crimes. The death of Bassinius, the rape of Lavinia, the falsified trial against the other Andronicus boys. All of these machinations and twisted, twisted doings are all laid at his feet. And Lucius swears to spare the child since Aaron confesses. He then gets the message from Saturninus and decides, okay, I'll meet with everybody at my father's house. Maybe we can straighten all this out and set things right. Especially now that he knows the source of it all and has Aaron in captivity. Meanwhile, Tamara decides to mess with Titus, who she thinks is crazy. She comes disguised as the spirit of revenge with her two sons, and the sons are supposed to represent rape and murder. 
or rather the avenging spirits against rapists and murderers. And although they look exactly like themselves, Titus acts like he's taken in. He is not that taken in though. And after being like, oh, you're the spirit of revenge? You're here to help me get revenge on my enemies, Tamara, Chiron, and Demetrius? Oh, good. Thank you for helping me. And Tamara convinces him to open his house up to this conference between Lucius and Saturninus and promises him that she will help him get revenge if he'll only give in to all of her demands here. And he says, well, okay, but I want murder and rape to stay here with me and help me prepare. Tamara says, thinking she's completely got him, this closing with him fits his lunacy. Whate'er I forge to feed his brain-sick humors, do you uphold and maintain in your speeches, for now he firmly takes me for revenge. And being credulous in this mad thought, I'll make him sin for Lucius his son. And whilst I at banquet hold him sure, I'll find some cunning practice out of hand to scatter and disperse the giddy goths, or, at the least, make them his enemies. She's gonna turn everything to her ends. Tamara tells her sons to yield to his humor, smooth and speak him fair, and tarry with him till I turn again. But Titus reveals that he's not as crazy as he looks. He says, I knew them all, though they supposed me mad, and will or reach them in their own devices, a pair of cursed hellhounds and their dam. He knows who they are, and now they've played right into his hands. He captures them with a few of his friends, and now he's got the rapist and the murderer right there in his clutches. We'll see shortly what revenge he's going to get on them and Tamara. Man, I love pie. In the final scene, Titus is dressed up in a chef's costume because he's prepared a banquet for Tamara and for Saturninus and for Lucius, and they all come in and sit down to dinner. This dinner is going to end badly, in a bloodbath, in fact because all will be revealed here, and everyone will get their revenge on everyone else. They're seated at dinner, and Lavinia is veiled so they can't see that her mouth is all messed up. And Titus says, Is it right to kill your daughter if she has shamed your family by being raped? And Saturninus says, Yeah, sure. And so at that moment, Titus turns around and stabs his daughter, Lavinia. It's very ambiguous. Is he doing this to mercy kill her? Does she want to die in this moment? Or is she like, I just learned how to talk with a stick. Don't kill me. I don't know. But in any case, he's making a point. He's trying to shock his audience and show them the truth by killing his daughter. Mm, brutal. Seems like there could have been an easier way to make that point. I don't know. And when everyone is shocked and horrified to find Lavinia slaughtered right in front of them, they all go, what? What did you do that for? And he says, because your sons, Tamara, raped and mutilated her. And Saturninus goes, quick, bring them out here and we'll get the whole story. We'll figure it out. Now, what was it that happened to the boys? Well, let's see. Uh, act five, scene two. Oh, yes. So he cuts their throats and drains their blood into a bowl, having Lavinia catch their blood for him. And when that they are dead, let me go grind their bones to powder small, and with this hateful liquor temperate. And in that paste, let their vile heads be baked. Come, come, be everyone officious to make this banquet, which I may prove more stern and bloody than the centaur's feast. So, now bring them in, for I'll play the cook, and see them ready against their mother comes. He cooked them into pies and served them for his mom? <laughs> After pointing out that she's just eaten her sons, Titus stabs Tamara. And then Saturninus stabs Titus. And then Lucius stabs Saturninus. And so he gets to be a burn now. The end. Oh, and Aaron's going to be half buried alive and then starved to death. What happens to the baby? We don't know. Do they kill it too, or do they let it live? One more note on Lavinia's silence. Not only is she silenced by Chiron and Demetrius when her tongue and hands are cut off, but she's also maybe silenced earlier? When Bassinius steals her off to marry her, yeah, he was previously engaged to her, but we really don't get a take on her part. There's also a weird mirror because Saturninus calls that runaway elopement rape. In Shakespeare's day, the word rape was used not only for 
sexual aggressive crime, but also to depict the kidnapping of a person. Lavinia is raped twice. And at the end, when her father again violates her by killing her, he does this after she's already found a voice. In some ways, he's silencing her again because of his own shame. Lavinia is the biggest tragic hero here. She continues to strive to find a way to communicate and overcome the things that have been done to her while continuing to be pressed down by every single member of her family. And Titus, that crazy action hero, he just can't seem to deal with ambiguity. When awful things have been done to his daughter, he doesn't know how to deal with it. And when he finally has a sword in his hand, he stabs and causes great action, but it only leads to disaster. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time as we look at one of Shakespeare's most famous and most loved, Romeo and Juliet. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.